There is a lot of stuff that hasn't worked in pro wrestling. I mean, fair play for people for trying, but when we all sit in execution and start questioning our own existence, you've got to admit something's gone badly. The kennel from hell match, for example. The big issue there should have been, how do we get the dogs to act how we want, but instead we just did it because we can. It's not just the types of fights we see either, because the gobbledygooker. And that's it too, not getting into it, just the gobbledy flipping gooker. These were never going to work regardless of the time or place, but there have been failures elsewhere that have potential to do well should they be brought back and tweaked. Given how much we're all crying out for variety too, why the hell shouldn't we at least give it a go, be that different setups or even characters? Just make sure it's not that reverse battle royal thing. My word. I'm Simon from What Culture and this is 10 failed concepts WWE needs to revive. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to stay notified. Ding, ding, done. Number 10, the Ambrose Asylum. Let's get things straight. WWE is not trying to do what many people see as the best pure wrestling in the world, or the type that lights up Japan and the indie scene. They're far more interested in the performance side of things and the storyline, and that's fine. We've all been watching it for years, and it's lovely. This is why the Ambrose Asylum was not the worst idea ever. Almost a spiritual successor to the likes of the baller and brawl of the casting match, it was designed to reinforce his character and give Ambrose somewhat of an edge as he fought Chris Jericho. It may not have worked last time around, but there's things we can change so it does work. Replacing the cage with a cell, for example, would stop any overwhelming anticlimactic drama, and hanging actual weapons from it would get rid of the comedy aspect that was present before. Let Dean be the master of it too, and you can build it up for years before he finally loses. Sounds daft, but so does the idea of a dead person never being defeated at something called WrestleMania. It's all about time, investment, and the odd switcheroo here and there. Number 9, the 1% heel. Alberto Del Rio worked so damn well on paper. The character was an up his own ass smart Alec who in his head was predestined for greatness. That is the complete opposite of what drives us to support a pro wrestler. Look at Daniel Bryan for example, if it's him against Del Rio, you want the plucky nice underdog to win. The real joy with a character like Alberto though is that it's a good reflection of the real world. The gulf between rich and poor is ridiculous in the 21st century, and therefore it's one that can be worked well. We don't watch pro wrestling for the status quo to continue, we watch it for our heroes to rise up and shake the world around. As ever, Ric Flair summed it up best when he said, it's the old adage that you like to hear someone's doing pretty good, but you don't want to hear they're doing better than you. And that's what WWE should try and tap into again. A guy doing well just because that's how he's built, even though you want to see them fall to their knees. It's an easy idea to give to any performer really, so why don't we do that? Exactly. On that note too, number 8, the intellectual idiot. This is even more prevalent today mostly because of social media. How many times have you been on Twitter and just wanted to kick off because of the high and mighty keyboard warriors who won't listen to reason? It works in the digital space and damn sure works in wrestling arenas around the world. In short, the guy who knows it all and is also happy to tell you that you know nothing is a guaranteed heat generator. There is a problem in the sense you could say up to this point there's been no one who has filled this role and also been able to take the persona and back it up in the ring, or at least not in the way that it needs to be done. They have to be technically gifted up the Wazoo, and that's not easy. Damien Sandow certainly came close to this, and his silent shtick was solid gold. He never got near the main event, and that's absolutely where someone like this needs to be. Think Mr. Perfect fused with a modern day edge, and you're as close to a modern day heel who would be despised by the masses. Naturally. Number 7, stepping away from wrestling. WWE has always experimented with wrestling away from the ring, and in recent times we've seen that more with that bizarre match between Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton, as well as the former battling Matt Hardy at the Hardy compound. The genius of wrestling is that it's loads of people working together, and because of that, you can always create something special. It doesn't always work, and if you've never seen WCW's Junkyard Invitational, then go and do that for all the evidence you need, but the fact we're talking about it is the point. All of these leave an impression because you simply can't do it within any other field. This means it can work, and because of that, we should continually revisit wrestling outside of the ropes. It breaks up the pace of a show if nothing else, especially if it's done on a three-hour Raw or a mammoth pay-per-view. Just the visual change is nice, and even if it is beyond terrible, that may work for some people. Look at the broken universe. That made me want to cry tears of joy, whereas others absolutely hated it. Isn't that the fun? Number 6, Feast or Fired. Every time TNA slash Impact Wrestling has done a Feast or Fired match, it's either been brilliant or so full of plot holes that it was hard to take seriously. We've seen seven attempts at it to date, and most have divided people right down the middle. I get this too. I mean, why would any manager risk losing a major star by firing them when, in the storyline, they could just go to a competitor? No one would sign off on that, but this is wrestling and wrestling is stupid, so you don't have to worry about it too much. 
That side, there is something here, especially if you want to shake up a particular superstar. You want Bray Wyatt to have a break from TV? Put him in Feast or Fired. Want Sin Cara to move to the other brand? Put him in Feast or Fired. Actually want a can of wrestler? Put them in Feast or Fired. At least they can go out with a bang. Impact seems likely to continue on with this, but WWE should come up with their own version and see what they can do because it can be quite dramatic. Just call it a last chance match or some nonsense like that. Could even focus on mid-card talent and give them something to do. Makes sense to me. Number five, the losing streak. This is actually an exciting idea at the moment because as I say these words, there's a guy in the midst of one and there's a guy who's good. His name is Kurt Hawkins. The problem with him is that despite being on a losing streak, it's not given any spotlight time at all. It's just there. If we actually started to use it, it could help everyone all around. This is the issue too. Usually in WWE, this idea is reserved for a punishment such as it was for one MVP. After coming in pretty damn hot, some backstage bother landed him in trouble and that was that. He never won again, and before long was just labelled as a loser. Switch over to Japan, however, and this concept was used to legitimise the great Kenta Kobashi as a fiery upstart in the late 1980s. Kobashi earned his way into the hearts of the AGPW fans as he came closer and closer to his first singles win. The crowd was just as important to the story as he was, and therefore everyone was desperate to see him reverse the situation. Used correctly, the losing streak is a winner because it generates sympathy for the good guy and heat for the bad guy. That may sound nuts if you've never seen it done well, but that's the whole point and why WWE should pounce on this. Number four, the Lion's Den. A debatable one, but the Lion's Den gimmick of the Attitude Era was an underrated vehicle for Ken Shamrock that left the landscape as quietly as the former UFC champ did. He was like a magician in that sense. One second he was there, and then he just wasn't. But focusing on the same points as we mentioned earlier, bringing something like this back and adjusting it for a modern audience could work, especially when the same wrestlers fight each other over and over again in the same damn scenario. If I have to see Roman Reigns and Bobby Lashley clash every week, throw them in a weird cage here and there. It'd be far more interesting, and you can hark back to what came before. You could even give this matchup to someone who needs it too. Imagine how cool and different it would be if Becky Lynch all of a sudden claimed this is her own, given her some mission talents. We all want to see more of the Attitude Era brought back, but we can't do that with content. Why can't we do it with more silly things like this? Number three, primetime wrestling. This may actually happen depending on what Fox want from their new deal with WWE. I'm certainly not saying that primetime wrestling was a failure. You may think that from the title. It's not what I mean. The original episodes have some tremendous moments, and the main reason it went away is because Vince McMahon decided it wasn't live and therefore didn't matter. The idea of a taped show soon died out. However, if we look at other sports, most do have some sort of pundit-led program that allows more people to enter the conversation through a pleasant highlight package. If you're based in the UK, think match the day where soccer is concerned. People love that stuff. A new version of primetime wrestling, hosted by Rene Young of course, would allow fans to get things in accessible bites, which is essential in 2018, and kind of bring back that talking smack vibe everybody misses. And you can play off nostalgia. Everybody loves nostalgia. Feels like a no-brainer to me. Number two, the championship scramble. WWE almost had it. The championship scramble, which was a brainchild of Pat Patterson, suffered because it lacked that extra something. For example, there was no reason why the performers who started the match started the match. Unlike Patterson's Raw Rumble, the Elimination Chamber, there were no eliminations, and therefore no immediate advantage. And then there was the fact we knew everyone involved, so the countdown that aimed for suspense didn't manage that at all. It was also dumb to include interim champions. If we don't do that for two out of three falls title bouts, why are we doing it here? Instead, let's live up to the premise promised by the name and have everyone in the scrap begin at the same time and then just fight to sudden death over 30 minutes. Then there's unpredictable drama, unseen falls, pin breakups, double pins and mass confusion before we can enjoy ridiculous multi-man sequences. And we get multi-person matches all the time anyway, let's try and spice them up. Number one, the invasion. For the first time since 2001, there's plenty of opportunity to actually play out the idea of an invasion and go all in with it. I mean, look at Neville and Austin Aries, who just walked out, Kevin Owens and Zami Zayn, who even teased a story like this recently, and right now, Chris Jericho, who's tearing up in Japan. And there's Cody Rhodes, the poster boy for leaving WWE and making it work. If the company wants to calm this growing competition, and they do, it should create the illusion of it happening under its own roof. It's not like it's going to be easy to just hire all those guys I just mentioned, but an NXT invasion onto the main roster is a major angle which WWE could pull off without the need for much expense. There's a genuine thread of logic behind it as well because a potential main roster call-up brings with it more money and a bigger spotlight, and that's exactly what every wrestler wants. Straight away then, there's a massive scope for storytelling here. You can buy into the initial premise and even start turning stars on a whim. Drew McIntyre, for example. He's on Raw right now, but he has NXT roots. He could be the poster boy for each, depending on which direction you want to go in. You could even have Triple H front and center, as that makes sense. This would be gold and make up for that disaster 
17 years ago. <laughs> Gosh, can you believe that that person said that about that particular video on that entry? I sure can't. Huh, but you should like, share and subscribe below anyway. And also, the people who made this video, they're right here. Go follow them and give them some love. Also, there's more content, probably above my head. Check it out. Or don't. 50-50.